Hey world history, welcome to unit one, lesson five, the rise of agriculture. By the way, my dog is being really barky right now, so I am so sorry if you can hear her barking in the background. So learning targets, students can describe when and how humans began to domesticate wild plants and animals and develop agricultural societies. Also compare and contrast the cultural differences between the hunter gatherer and early agricultural societies. Your job, you're gonna watch this ed puzzle. Any questions that are in blue text or questions I want you to answer directly on the ed puzzle. Anything in red text is going to be an important concept, so you should be writing it down in your study guide. And of course, if you have any questions, please, please, please let me know. I am here to help you out. So let's talk about hunters and gatherers first. So in the Ed Puzzle, type in what you think hunter-gatherer societies were like and what you think agricultural societies were like. Just take your best educated guess. I'm not grading it on if it's right or wrong. All right, let's first talk about hunters and gatherers. So who were these people? Well, of course, as the name implies, hunters. Duh. Okay, so they would hunt animals. They also would use known tools or obsidian tools. They typically hunted in groups, but they would also gather wild plants. So one of the really interesting animals that have lived in Minnesota during, well, even before Minnesota was Minnesota, I'm talking about tens of thousands of years ago would be mastodons and mammoths. So these giant elephant like creatures, they did indeed live in what we now call Minnesota today. So one of the really interesting theories about how these two species went extinct was actually that hunters killed them off. Yeah, that's right. Human hunters. So these two animals were killed off about 13,000 years ago. Um, but they also did not just exist in North America. They also existed in Africa, Southeast Asia, also Northern Europe. There's also some very strange animals that used to live in what we call Minnesota thousands of years ago. One of them being the giant bison. So if you see down here, I know it's kind of hard to get a gauge of how big it was. Uh, so, but if you've ever seen a modern day bison before, just think of that, except for these gigantic horns. Um, and it could be up to twice the size of what a modern day bison is, which is crazy to even think about. Another thing that went extinct that used to live in Minnesota was actually a type of camel. Right? I know you think of camel like deserts and stuff like that. But yeah, there used to be one that lived in um, what we call Minnesota now. Uh, but that went extinct as well. There's also ground sloths, um, which were pretty much giant sloths that walked on the ground. And there was also something called the giant beaver. Uh, so just think of a modern day beaver, but blow it up so big that it's bigger than a human being. Yeah, they still or they used to exist in Minnesota as well. Uh, once in a while, people will find like skull fragments of these creatures. All right, now let's talk about something that made humans humans, and that was cooking meat. So hearths. Um, so humanoids cooked meat about 1.4 million years ago, and they did this through hearths or kind of like fireplaces. And that started about 500,000 years ago. Um, so what a hearth is, is kind of what's pictured down here. You can see it's made of like stone or brick of some sort. You would put the fire logs down here in these holes, light the fire, the top here gets hot. Then you can lay both meat or veggies over the top and cook them. All right, here's kind of a fun little guessing game. Now, I'm not going to grade you on if you're right or wrong. Just try your best. But I want you to put in order what plants you think got domesticated first. And your options are banana, sugarcane, wheat, peas, beans, squash, rice, and corn. I know this was a little tricky. Um, and some of these answers actually might surprise you a little bit. So the first two plants to ever get domesticated would be wheat and peas. And this actually happened in Southeast Asia about 8,500 BCE. The second would be rice, which was domesticated in China about 7,500 BCE. And now the next one kind of surprised me because I 
you know, I don't know. I feel like bananas are more of a modern day thing. Um, but yeah, bananas and sugarcane actually got domesticated in the New Guinea region. And that was about 7,000 BCE. And then very last would be corn, beans, and squash, which is domesticated in Mesoamerica, which is kind of what like Latin America is today. So like countries like Mexico, Guatemala, El Salvador, like Peru, that would be kind of like the Mesoamerica area. That was 3,500 BCE. So what caused agriculture? What caused humans to be like, hey, you know what? This hunter, hunting and gathering just is not working well anymore. What should we do differently to ensure our survival? So one of the biggest changes that happened to humans was climate change. Now, when we talk about climate change, like in the news and stuff, we're talking about climate change that humans are causing due to putting like fossil fuels and carbon into the air. Now, climate change has existed long, long, long before, well, even humans were alive. Pretty much since the earth was made, climate change has been happening. Um, so, and it does it naturally as well. Um, it's just humans and cars and planes also cause it to accelerate. So there was a warming period in climate change about 6,000 to 2,000 BCE. And this caused a lot of droughts in the Middle East, but also caused a ton of excess rain near the equator. So humans that were living more towards the equator, they would see more thicker forests growing, but also less hunting game to be eaten. So here's a question for you. How do you think archeologists and climate scientists know the earth was warming? So just try your best. So do you think it's A, counting the rings and fossil trees? B, collecting chemicals found in ice caps? C, diving deep into the ocean? Or D, examining desert sand? There are actually two correct answers for this one. It'd be A, counting the rings and fossil trees. Now, if you've ever seen petrified wood before, it is a really cool thing. Um, if you haven't, I totally suggest that you go and, I don't know, try to find petrified wood, which is like really hard. And anyway, so petrified wood is really cool because it was dead trees, but over time, minerals would take place of what the cells were in the trees. Um, so instead of like tree cells in wood, um, those cells would get replaced with things like quartz and iron. So that's why it's such a colorful mosaic like you see right here in this picture. But the cool thing about um, fossil trees is also it preserved the rings of the tree. So just like modern day trees, right? Like you cut it down and you'll see all the rings. So the rings indicate um, every year how much like water um, and the temperature the climate had for that year. So scientists can actually look at these fossilized trees and they can still count the rings in the trees because the bigger the ring typically meant more rainfall, the smaller the ring usually meant less rainfall. Also collecting chemicals found in ice caps. So climate scientists would go to like the North Pole or the South Pole and they would dig deep into the ice. And what they would do is they would count or they would measure how much carbon is in the ice and that would like kind of give them an indication of what the temperatures were like for the earth during that time period. All right, next let's talk about the origins of agriculture. So it wasn't just all of a sudden everyone everywhere knew how to like farm and produce food. There is actually little places around the world where agriculture began. So some of these areas include Africa, up here in the Middle East, China, New Guinea, uh, parts of the United States, or what we know as the United States today, down here by Mexico, and also here in South America. All right, and then how did this agriculture spread to across the globe? So that really depends on what continent that you're talking about. So the really interesting thing is that with the America, so North and South America, agriculture typically spread from North to South. So for example, um, so corn was domesticated in like Southern Mexico or Guatemala, modern day terms. 
And then that like knowledge of how to domesticate corn would then travel from north to south. With Africa, it was also north and south, but with Eurasia, it was actually east to west. So how did agriculture come about? So when faced with challenges, humans, they just innovate. And that's still true today. So what would happen is humans would select the best seeds that a plant would produce. They looked for qualities such as larger seeds, less bitter, high productive rate, and to outgrow non-human selected plants. So one of the biggest examples of this would be corn. So about 3,500 years ago, corn did not look like what modern day corn looks like today. It actually looked like this little chunk of grass. That's all it was. But over time, humans would selectively breed the corn. So then it would start having these kind of bigger, larger, sweeter kernels like you see right here. And then there is so much selective breeding that today, well, this is what corn looks like. So once the human selected or domesticated plants grew, typically they would then take over all the surrounding land that the native plants had. So here's a question. How do you think the growth of towns and cities linked to agriculture? Now, I'm not writing you if you're right or wrong. Just take your best educated guess. So you kind of have to think of it, you know, kind of the big picture, almost hypothetically. So let's say that we have a group of people and they're starting out an agriculture society. And then some more people get added to the group. So once more people get added to the group, that means that that group of people need more crops to be harvested to feed all the people. But in order for those crops to be harvested, you need a lot of working hands. So that means you've got to add more people to your society so you have more manpower to harvest those crops. But then you get more people in your group. And the more people you get in the group, the more crops you have to grow in order to feed everybody. And that leads to more manpower. So it's just this big snowballing effect of how agriculture societies began. Um, so they would start with a small group of people, but then as they could feed more mouths, those towns grew to cities and they grew just bigger and bigger and bigger. But also in the societies, they don't need just farmers. They also need specialized people to count the crops, to make the trades, to store the crops, and to make the food. So here's some other results of agriculture. So because people were farming, they could stay in one place. So that kind of halted the movement of humans and went away with nom nomads. Also, uh, the larger humans were in a group or the larger the number of humans were in a group that meant more protection from outside forces. Also, larger human numbers meant more genetic diversity and more crops meant more nutrients. So let's zoom in on the Fertile Crescent. So here is a map of the Fertile Crescent. So as you can see here today, um, it is, I know this map's a little hard to read because the green doesn't stand out so much, but it would be in what is modern day Middle East. I believe I mentioned this in a previous video, but we did talk about the Tigris and the Euphrates River. So the Tigris and the Euphrates River are super important to early civilizations. So these city-states or civilizations that popped up during the Mesopotamia age um, really focused around these two rivers. So they gave them not only water, but also transportation. So as you can see here, um, they run quite a ways up all the way into what is modern yeah. Turkey. So what makes the Fertile Crescent fertile? Like I said before, the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, but why? So here's a question for you. When a river floods, what is typically left behind? And this can also be left behind when lakes flood too. I know, this one's kind of a hard question. Typically one or two students every year get this question right. So it is silt. What is silt? So silt is super fine soil that is super nutrient rich. And if it's really nutrient rich, that means it is 
fabulous for farming. So here's a picture of what silt looks like. So historians really love, but they also really hate the Fertile Crescent. So historians love the Fertile Crescent because as an Asian civilizations like are super awesome, super fun to learn about. But why they hate the Fertile Crescent is because the Tigris and Euphrates River often shift course. They also leave traces of artifacts underwater. Um, and artifacts are typically buried really deep within the silt or the water. And this can be, cause it to become very confusing to analyze. So one of the things that I really want to zoom on, in on is this city called Chatal Hayuk. Now Chatal Hayuk is in modern day Turkey. And you can see where it is right here. And it's also on the northern edge of the Fertile Crescent. So right here would be like the Tigris in the Euphrates River. So Chatel Hayuk uh, was inhibited about 7,000 to 5,000 BCE. And it's super important because they had things like ornaments, weapons, tools, even mirrors, fine pottery, woven baskets, woolen clothes, and also leather. And then with Chatel Hayuk, it was a farming community. So that meant they were based on agriculture. And one of the other really interesting things about this city is their houses. So here's a picture of what the archaeological site of Chatel Hayuk is. Um, and you can see all the walls of what the mud brick houses look like. But what was more impressive is like, instead of when you think of houses today, right, like in a suburb or something like that, um, you know, where they're all separate and in their own yard, the Chatel Hayuk houses were actually built side by side by side. So it would form a giant wall protecting the city. Another really interesting thing about Chatel Hayuk is one of the first civilizations to use metal. So Archaeologists have found metalworking equipment in stoves, but it's not just any metal they're using. These people were using gold and silver and also copper and lead. So here's a good question. Are gold and silver used for weapons and tools typically? No, they're not. So gold and silver are typically used for things like ornaments. Right. And when I mean ornaments, I'm talking about like jewelry, little knickknacks, things to show status. Also with copper and lead, that is a huge advancement in human society, because that means humans are making fires hot enough to bend these metals. So pretty much goodbye to the Stone Age. Well, at least for Chatel Hayuk, they were one of the first civilizations to do this. Um, the other civilizations had a few more thousand years and before they caught on. All right, let's wrap it up for today. So today we learned about what caused agriculture. How did agriculture come about? Other results of agriculture, what makes the Fertile Crescent fertile, and also Chatel Hayuk. Next up, you are going to do U1L6 Bronze Age, Babylonia, Anatolia, Assyria, Ed Puzzle. Also the weekly check-in, and of course, if you have any questions, comments, or simply want to learn more, please let me know. I'm more than happy to help. All right. Thanks for watching. Bye.